welcome to You Are Not A Frog, the podcast for GPs, doctors and other professionals in high stress jobs. Working in today's pressured environment, you may feel like a frog in boiling water. Things have heated up so slowly that you might not have noticed the extra long days becoming the norm. You've got used to feeling constantly busy and often one crisis away from not coping. Let's face it, frogs only have two options, to stay in the pan, be boiled alive or to hop out and leave. But you are not a frog. And that's where this podcast comes in. You can do more than just hop out or burn out. There are simple changes that you can make which will make a huge difference to your stress levels and help you enjoy life again. I'm your host, Dr Rachel Morris, GP, turned executive coach, speaker, specialist in workplace resilience and creator of the Shapes Toolkit training programme. In the podcast, I'll be chatting with friends, colleagues and experts, all who have an interesting take on this stuff, so that together we can take back control and thrive. If you want more resources, including CPD reflection forms for the podcast, then make sure you've signed up to the You Are Not A Frog Collective and please share these podcasts with anyone who needs them. On with the episode. So it's really brilliant to have with me on the podcast today, Dr. Amrita Sen Mukherjee. Now, Amy's a portfolio GP. She's got a special interest in occupational medicine um, and positive psychology and well-being. She's a next generation le- GP leader. She's also an educator at, at King's. She's also the RCGP First Five well-being leader. And for those of you who you don't know what First Five are, the First Five is the, the term we use for, for GPs who are in their first five years after qualifying. And not only that, Amy, but you're mum to two small kids, so you're now also being home educator, is that right? Yes, that's right. A a role that um, I wouldn't say that I'm enjoying so much, but that I'm taking on with both hands and trying my best at. Oh, gosh. I prefer teaching adults, let me say that. (laughs) And how old are your kids? Uh, They're six and three. Right. So you're probably not getting a minute to yourself at home, I'm thinking. No, unfortunately not. Um, my husband has quite long working hours as well. So we're both doing this split shift system where we're both managing childcare, managing our working lives and unfortunately working a little bit late in the evenings, which we're hoping won't carry on for too much longer. So I got Amy on the podcast because I really wanted to talk to her about some of the sort of positive psychology things that we, we've been discussing together recently. And I find positive psychology really, really fascinating. And use quite a lot of the stuff, particularly from Martin Seligman during my during my shapes course. And we were we were chatting the other day, weren't we, about well-being? And um I said, Oh, actually, I really want to get you on the podcast because there's some really useful stuff. Because at the moment we're in the right in the middle of the coronavirus crisis and it's it's affecting everyone um we did a um faculty medical leadership and management webinar on well-being a couple of days ago so we'll put that link in the show notes if you want to uh, have a bit more of a deep dive into well-being um but i thought actually there was some really useful stuff that that came out of that and came out of some of our discussions so i mean first of all you know how, how are you keeping well during the coronavirus crisis of being being stuck at home? Yeah, so it's been really interesting because all the usual things that I do um, have had to be shelved and I've had to think of new ways of keeping well, as it were. Um, I do a lot of work from home and so I've had three very lovely people invade my personal space and my professional space and I've had to relegate myself to new working environments um, and that's been quite quite a an accommodation shall we say so I'd like to I'm very lucky to have a garden so I try to spend some time in my garden even just 10 minutes a day just breathing in the fresh air Um, and I try to minimize my phone time to be honest and minimize my time uh, looking at the news I definitely like to keep up to date with the news and keep up to date with um, medical protocols and things like that but I limit the amount of screen time I have and the amount of interaction I have because I think that's a healthy way for me personally to um, try to focus and recalibrate essentially uh, and try to give myself some time for my own well-being because I can find that I do get a little bit overwhelmed with things if I'm constantly bombarded with new information and uh, having that coupled with invasion of my own space and my work environment has been a little bit of a new concept to handle shall we say. Yeah it's a bit of a double whammy isn't it we, we were talking in the webinar on Monday about the the vortex of busyness and how when you get extra busy you give up you stop doing those things that 
that fill you up that give you energy that make life worth living and the, it just all becomes about the about the work the problem is it's not only are most of us a lot more busy than usual but also we can't do those things we can't get out and do my thing is circuit training with with a bunch of friends I can't do that at the moment and I can't go out for coffee and I'm really really missing that yeah absolutely and that human connection is really really important to keep and I'm I'm certainly missing that as well um, I love to see my sister all the time and I, I just can't see her at all um, and even just small things like calling my friends and being able to have a five minute catch up with them I'm just not finding time in the day to do that so I'm, I'm personally really really missing that that connection with friends and family um, so I'm trying to think of ways that I can build that back into my time and I think it's really important to be real about the things that we are missing so that we can be mindful about how to build them back into our lives and make sure that we place importance on them as well mm. so sort of intuitively we know that well-being being mentally as fit and as healthy as you can and physically as fit as healthy as, as you can we know that that's important, but from a, a positive psychology perspective, why is it so so important? Yeah, it's really interesting um, because there are so many different theories um, that propose why positive psychology is so important. Um, and if we take it back a step, actually thinking about the concept of well-being, there are so many concepts of well-being and why well-being is important to us. And you're talking about um, physical activity and connection with people and yes we all know that that's important and it makes us feel good and we get the positive benefits of that but why do we do that mm. um, you know why do we get those benefits and it's quite easy to think so before I started studying all of this it's quite easy for people to think um, that there isn't much science behind well-being mm. but actually there is so much research into um, the phenomena of well-being and as such because there is so much research there are so many different theories of well-being and so many different concepts of what makes well-being and why it's important to us so it could be a physical state it could be academic achievement it could be physical achievement if you're an athlete um, it could be goal-directed behaviors it could be um, so many different things it could be, Martin Seligman talks about the pleasant life he talks about the meaningful life um, there are so many different concepts but actually if we think about an, another concept uh, proposed by Barbara Friedrichsen about positive emotions. Actually, the concept of positivity and having positive emotions builds on positivity and not just in a linear fashion, but in a circular and spherical fashion as well. And so that builds on many, many different parts of our lives. Um, and so by inviting positive uh, activities, a positive frame of mind, what we're doing is, is we're encouraging the neuroplasticity of our brain to think in different ways to make new connections and in doing so we naturally become more positive and we try to um, subconsciously then uh, move away from the negative bias that we more naturally feel um, and just become more positive in our own mindsets therefore um, developing a more a, a more healthy way of being which is why positivity and uh, positive psychology can be so important for us at this specific time when we're going through such huge seismic changes so I think some people would say why is positivity important surely it's better to be negative to be a bit pessimistic you know because that will protect us if we always think the worst if you always prepare for the worst then surely we'll we'll survive we'll survive longer we'll, we'll do better Yes, um, and that's a really interesting thought as well. And it's important for us to be mindful of the fact that we need to have a balance. Um, and so I'm not saying be positive to the exclusion of all negativity or um, the only way to be is to be positive because that isn't realistic. Um, we're all human beings. We all have positive emotions. We all have negative emotions. Um, but the way we have evolved is for us to be more um, attuned to the negativity in life. So I suppose what I'm saying is, is we have to teach ourselves or train ourselves to be more welcoming of the positives that we feel, celebrate those positives that we feel, because as human beings, we're generally not very good at that. Um, mm. it, culturally as well, um, as British people, we're not very good at that either. We're not very good at putting ourselves forward and celebrating our successes because um, it's just not really the done thing. Um, 
so if we are more mindful of, of the positive things in our lives, um, we become more accepting of them. And you're absolutely right. There is a certain aspect of being aware of the negativity um, allows us to prepare for it, to mitigate for difficult conditions. And that essentially is a survival mechanism. Um, and it's important to have those mechanisms in place, but not to the exclusion of being positive, because by doing that, um, we aren't strengthening our resilience reservoirs we're not strengthening our um, ability to protect ourselves in future times when we might need to call on um, the resources that we have to pull ourselves through difficult situations um, if that if, if i'm making sense there yeah. so does does positivity and positive emotion does that do something for us in terms of performance in terms of productivity in terms of I get well I guess, I guess being positive is going to make you enjoy life better as well but are there any other benefits to it absolutely a uh, huge benefit so positivity actually increases our productivity it increases our efficiency and um, there have been studies to show that it actually is beneficial for our physical health as well so it reduces right. heart rate and reduces blood pressure um, and by doing so naturally will reduce our total peripheral resistance as well it improves our serotonin levels in our brain it improves our dopamine levels as well which naturally increase the energy that we have which naturally incre uh, increases our motivation and therefore we become more productive um, in our behaviors and we have more goal-directed behaviors as well so the things that we are actually carrying out become more meaningful as well so we're not just um willy-nilly carrying out tasks we're actually carrying out tasks with a more focused mindset um, but another aspect as well of positivity is that it actually um strengthens what we call the, the creative aspect of our minds as well and it um, allows our mind to develop um a growth mindset and allows us to thrive as well. And that thriving and flourishing behavior is really, really important in times of hardship because um, that sense of creativity, that sense of thriving allows us to pull on the resources that we've used in the past when we've had difficult situations. Um, and we can see people doing that now in this current uh, predicament that, that we are facing globally and locally as well. Mm. so being positive is not all about sort of skipping around the room like bambi going isn't isn't life brilliant it's it's a bit deeper than that and actually it's doubly important when things are really hard absolutely um it is really really important um to embrace the positive but also acknowledge and embrace the negative as well so um, i've spoken about it before about making sure that we have meaningful balance in life and not ignoring um the reality of what we're facing and so it's being accepting of our emotions and um, acknowledging our emotions and then being able to deal with our emotions because only by acknowledging our emotions can we accept them can we act on them in a meaningful way um, and exactly what you said it's not all about just skipping around in a, a bambi kind of way and you know looking at or the larger dark is actually for quite a lot of people there isn't much of that at the moment mm. um, and so this may not resonate with a lot of people but it's about finding the positives in in really small things as well so for a lot of our healthcare colleagues out there it might be something as simple as having a hot meal mm. it might be something as simple as um being able to line your bed at night and knowing that you've done a really good job for a few patients that you've seen that day it might be feeling the sheets against your skin um, and feeling the warmth of your bed. It might be being able to come home and saying hi to your family or seeing your family across a virtual interface. It's making sure that you are mindful of the positives that you have in your life um, and acknowledging them and being grateful for them. So, so being mindful, so no noticing them for a start, um, being grateful and I guess one way to be grateful which we talked about was to keep a gratitude journal just keeping you know list of a few things every day are there any other ways to increase one's product po one's positivity in life yes there there are lots of ways so um we've spoken about the gratitude diary yeah. there's another positive psychology intervention called three best things or um uh yeah, th three, three best things. Yeah. If you were to um, Google that, you'd be able to find uh, 
the exact way of uh, conducting that. But essentially mm -hmm. what that is, is, it, is not writing an essay or not writing prose because at this time, time is limited. Um, but actually just writing bullet points of, you know, three things that happened in your day that, that have been nice, you know, which could be a stranger waved at me um, that made me feel valued or um, having a hot cup of tea that felt nice against my lips or you know just being mindful of all these small things that, that are giving us joy at this moment and um, another really great and um, positive psychology intervention um which has been shown to have great um influence and impact on increasing positive emotions and gratitude specifically and also meaning in life which is something martin seligman talked about is something called the meaningful photos um positive psychology intervention um, and that is when you were to, if, if, if you were to um, use your camera on the phone, because everybody has smartphones now, or using um, an automated phone, uh, you know, uh, if, if you were to have one, and actually taking photos of things that mean something to you. And I understand that in this particular time, that might be really hard because the things that probably mean a lot to you at the moment, you don't have access to. Um, but you could think about maybe when you're parked up in your car, if you see a bird or if you were to see a cloud formation um, or if you're lucky to enough to have a garden, um, the sunrise or something like that. So taking photos um, of things that mean something to you um, at time one. And then at some point later in time, looking at those photos and reflecting on why those are meaningful to you. Mm. Going back to those photos, those same photos about a week later, and reflecting on those photos again. So not taking too many photos, probably about nine to 12 photos, but going back to those same photos about a week later and reflecting on those photos again, and really thinking about the meaning behind those photos and why those photos were so important to you, has actually been shown to improve mood. It's been shown to improve uh, people's understanding of their value in life their understanding of their identity and therefore that's had direct um, influence on gratitude and people's meaning in life as well. So that might be something that people might want mm. to partake in if they're looking for different things to do. Yeah, that's interesting. I love this, the, the idea of meaning because I think meaning is, is such a powerful motivational factor, isn't it? And I know that in um, Daniel Pink's book, Drive, which is a brilliant book, by the way, guys, if you, you want to read a really good book about motivation, then Drive is the one to read. It talks about, you know, we need to have autonomy. Uh, we need to have mastery. So we need to be good at what we do or feel that we're getting towards mastery. But actually, we also need meaning and purpose in our lives. And I just wonder if recently, well, before the coronavirus crisis i think i was talking to a lot of doctors coaching some people meeting people at courses and they, they were finding that perhaps the meaning had slid out of things a little bit for them i don't know if you'd had that experience with with doctors i have yes i've had quite a lot of doctors talk to me about um their difficulties with autonomy in their careers and that's quite often um seen during training because when you're in the training route um you're told where your job is you're told where you have to either whether you have to relocate somewhere or whether you have to go to different hospitals quite often people are separated from their families um as a gp trainee you um have different rotations uh, you're told which rotation you, you're going to be partaking in there's very little choice um in our professions actually as as medical practitioners until we get to the point where we reach cct or if you've taken time out and, and you've done a different role like a caesar role um, to achieve consultant positions and that's really really interesting that you hit upon that point because autonomy is so important in terms of a motivational theory called the self-determination theory proposed by two positive psychologists called ryan and decky and what autonomy shows is that actually if people um, are actually um, masters of their own destiny, if they have that ability to choose the direction of their, their intrinsic motivation increases because the, um, the actions that they're partaking in align with their identity, they align with their values, and they, are de they align with their purpose. And so because they have 
um, alignment of their identity, their values and their purpose, the autonomy increases. Um, and that's really, really important for um, goal directed behavior and for people to feel good about themselves. Because when you have purposeful goal directed behavior, we automatically feel great about ourselves because when we achieve something, we achieve it because we want to achieve it and because we're working towards the goals that we have, not towards someone else's goals. We're essentially marching to our own beat and not to the beat of somebody else. Mm. That that's, yeah, that's really fascinating. So actually autonomy can increase, is all really linked with meaning as well and purpose. And if we have a more autonomy, our intrinsic motivation increases. Now I've not heard that before. And for those listeners that haven't heard the phrase intrinsic motivation before, there are two different types of motivation. You've got intrinsic, which is something coming from yourself saying, I need to, I really want to do this because I would love to be a doctor or do this or pass my diploma. Um, extrinsic motivation is me bribing my children saying if you do 20 minutes of clarinet practice tonight I'll give you a cream egg <laughs> so that's that's extrinsic motivation and it's a lot lot weaker than intrinsic motivation so anything that can in increase intrinsic motivation is is really important but also yeah. me it's difficult right and I think with the covid crisis lots of us are getting much less autonomy than we we had so how can we increase our feeling of autonomy even when we actually have less of it is that possible yeah. well that, that's a really interesting question Rachel because I think already pre-covid doctors were having difficulty with their autonomy anyway yeah that's very true um and the way in which we could increase our autonomy is in our personal lives but then if you look at the covid situation um our autonomy in our own personal lives is being diminished on a minute by minute basis as well. So wh where do we go with that? What can we do? We have to limit our consideration of the factors that we can control. And I think understanding and being accepting of the things that we can now control um, is one step in the right direction to accepting that our autonomy is changing. And this isn't forever. This isn't, um, going to be hopefully for the rest of our lives but it's for the short term and if we can change our mindset in the short term it will hopefully be really beneficial to us so if people like to go to the gym or you you mentioned that you like to go circuit training okay you can't do that with your friends anymore but you might be able to do something on zoom with them mm -hmm. or um, you might be able to have um, a chat with them in the evenings instead so swapping one activity for another um, so I think just trying to manage the things that we really want to do with things that we can do would be a really good way of shifting our understanding of the present sense of autonomy yeah I think that's a really important point in fact I am I'm doing zoom circuits every morning because my lovely trainer is, is is streaming it to us all and exactly. actually I think we have <clears throat> I always sort of joke that that doctors in particular have control issues that we take far too much control over things we shouldn't do and we don't take enough control over things that that we, sh we should do so I think we feel incredibly responsible for all our patients and society and probably all our friends and our family and stuff when actually we have far less control over our patients health than we think we do I mean with you know healthcare can only affect the, what 15 percent of the determinants of health you know it's a very small amount but then we don't you know but then we get very stressed about working conditions and things like that we can't change but then we don't do the really small things to help ourselves like get to bed at a decent hour and you know maximize our on our sleep or our or exercise or actually put in the small changes and we just get sucked into yeah the social media thing of just you know having our phones in our bedroom and scrolling through Facebook and scaring ourselves before bedtime and all those sorts of things. Um, or even, you know, when, when we do have a choice about where we work, I think we often feel very dutiful about where we should work and how long we should carry on doing it. And I ought to do this and I ought to do that because we're very responsible people. Um, but actually thinking to yourself, what, what choices do I have? And when I, when I teach, I teach about this and I always get people saying, yeah, but I don't like the choices that I've got. <laughs> that's the problem. But actually, you know, that's where acceptance comes in. Actually, you might not like the choices that you've got, but you 
you always do have a choice and I guess yeah we're at home at the moment we're stuck we can't do much apart from go out go out to work and I guess we can't really change where we're working at the moment what we're expected of us but there, there is still quite a lot of choice about that about how you are when you're at work what your what your mindset is who you interact with how you interact with your team how kind you are to other people and know all those sorts of things yeah I think there's a certain element of choice um you're, at, you're right but people are being pushed to the limits at the moment mm. um, in their working environments and the external factors um, surrounding PPE, surrounding the numbers coming through the doors, surrounding um, patient morbidity yeah. is very, very difficult at the moment. And I think that um, is influencing behaviour in a way that it, ha- it, it, it has always influence behavior but I think it's influencing behavior in a way that it hasn't done before um to the extreme so everything's been heightened essentially um and I think these types of things like looking after our well-being is so important at times like this because yes this is a difficult situation now but unfortunately it will get more difficult in in weeks to come and so if we can put the safeguards in at this moment in time Mm -hmm. actually we're protecting ourselves so it's almost like a prophylactic measure if we want to think yeah. about it in medical terms um and it's really really important to think about it in in that way mm. um there are other po- are other parts of the self-determination theory as well which i think are really key to doctor well-being and why we might be seeing the struggles that doctors are going through at this moment in time too um but autonomy is certainly one of them yeah so what else do you think is really important for sort of understanding this a little bit more Sure. So one of the key factors, I think, is that generally speaking, as doctors, we're competent individuals, we're intelligent individuals, we're well-educated individuals. Mm -hmm. And this current crisis has really um, pushed us out of our comfort zone. It's pushed us into an area of no man's land. It's pushed us into an area where we're having to reframe our learning, reframe the narrative of what was norm and it's not something where we can look to our seniors or look to our more experienced colleagues around the world and say, Hey, how did you manage this? Everybody's learning at the same time. And although that's a great situation to be in because you know that you're not the only one in that boat, it's also a really nerve wracking situation as well. It's really uncomfortable. Because it's uncomfortable. Absolutely. Because as medics, we're used to, if I don't know that I'll just go and ask someone else because someone else knows that you know I've got my skill set but that other colleague of mine has got their skill set um but we're finding at the moment that everybody's in the same position where no one has exactly the right skill set um and that's no criticism it's just it's it's just this is so new um and and how how do you deal with this novel virus well everybody mucks in everybody's doing the best that they can Mm. and I think that's really important that people are just mindful of the fact that everyone's doing the best that they can and um give yourself a pat pat on the back for for just being there for just showing up Um, yeah I think that so often we beat ourselves up about the fact we don't know something or we don't know how to treat something or I must be I must be useless because I got that wrong but actually yeah give yourself a break it's you know no one knows how to treat this we're all doing up we're doing our best yeah. And actually, even if you do make a mistake that was a preventable mistake, everyone makes mistakes. Nobody make, is, is 100 percent, you know, accurate the whole time. And I guess I guess if you're looking at autonomy there and control, the one thing you do have control over it, it mainly is how you're looking after yourself and your well-being. And if you are looking after yourself well, you are less likely to make to make mistakes you're less likely to be in that negative frame of mind that negative mindset where you're backed into the corner and you're hijacked by your amygdala and and that is a really bad place for making lots of mistakes as well so I think I think it's finding that choice that choice in what we we do have choices about which which when it feels limited there, there there always are some things and and focusing on that rather than what you what we can't control about you know what the government's doing if if there's enough PPE, what what the policies are, which is could be really stressful. So so how how else can the self determination theory help us to actually 
overcome all this? Does it give any pointers or suggestions? Well, I would say with regarding to competence, just acknowledging that everyone else in your team is in the same position and to talk to people, that that bonding and that connectedness of, of actually talking to people will really, really help you through this time. It will make you feel less, less uncertain about your own in, incompetency um, because actually knowing that others are in the same boat as you um, shows you that you don't have to be alone. You're not in it alone. You, you won't be going home at night ruminating and thinking because rumination is dangerous. Mm. Um, knowing that you've shared your thoughts with your team is so supportive. Mm. Um, so consider that and if you are finding yourself in a situation where you are very very concerned reach out there are support services out there php is an amazing resource um or if you are wanting coaching reach out to coaches but if you're needing psychological help there's no shame in that and there's no stigma around that and that php resource is there to help doctors um, and it's a huge huge resource that, that should be utilized um, and another part of the that brings me on to my last point about self-determination theory is the relatedness. Um, and I think pre-COVID, the relatedness in doctors had been missing because of the defragmentation of the um, uh, firms. So right. the firm structure had been uh, completely dissolved, meaning that junior doctors didn't have a team. So as they went through the ranks, they hadn't learned so much about camaraderie and they hadn't learned so much about supporting juniors. Um, so when they got into senior roles of consultancy, um, they were taught in a very different environment to say consultants of the past. Um, and what we're seeing now is actually the reignition of the firm structure with the COVID environment in the hospital mm. um, environment anyway and we're also seeing in general practice the camaraderie in the hot hubs uh, camaraderie in uh, practices because actually remote working is causing people to communicate a lot better than maybe they would do if they were working in the same practice on a face-to-face -face yeah. basis so what we are seeing is excellent use of um, emotional support amongst teams and team working which brings to the last the last part of the self-determination theory about relatedness and that human connection is so important. So you don't actually have to physically connect with people, but having that emotional and psychological support from people and knowing that your team are in it with you, you're in it together is so important. Um, yeah. Being able to foster that into your environment if it's not already there. Yeah. Will really pay dividends. Yeah. I think people do have to be especially careful for that. So I know there are some teams that have got really <laughs> they're really great now but there are quite a lot of GPs who are working from home or locums who are popping into different surgeries or maybe working on 111 or you know other, and they might not necessarily have a team that they can plug into yeah. and again what can you con control what can you do about that well you know you'll always know a few GPs in the area get onto them on WhatsApp and go can we have a Zoom call or something something like that because I think I think you're right it's it's just so in, so important yeah it really so, is it really is i can't highlight the importance of emotional connection um and just friendship mm. so can you can you just sum up the self-determination theory for me in, in a couple of sentences sure okay so um the self-determination theory considers three points uh, which are autonomy competency and relatedness and if you were to have these three things essentially they contribute to um, a motivational theory which improves our um, ability for us to um, thrive, to grow, to be creative and generally speaking if all of these things are in line our well-being improves. So what I've been seeing amongst the medic community, amongst the people who've been speaking to me through my different roles is that these three facets of their being has been out of kilter and so if we can try to realign these in whatever way is um, sufficient or appropriate for individuals hopefully our motivation can try to realign again and will be more supportive for us not just in a motivational point of view but in an overall well-being point of view as well mm. and I guess all that sort of combines then to help us feel a bit more positive and then positivity breeds 
breeds performance, breeds, you know, well-being and all that sort of thing. So you sort of add it up into the, the mash pot. So, so well-being is not just about doing enough exercise, getting enough sleep, eating well. It's also about making sure that you've got this relatedness and connectedness, that you have got autonomy, so control over what's happening to you and decisions. But even if you haven't got autonomy there, you might be able to get autonomy over here. And so it, it's just, it, it, it's all right. Because there's got to be some situations where you, you know, what, was there any research that came out of, I know that I'm just thinking of the sort of concentration camps and the Viktor Frankl stuff, you know, when Viktor Frankl, who was the Austrian psychologist, was, he wrote Man's Search for Meaning, didn't he? And he, he had absolutely no autonomy in the concentration camp. He was in there as, a, as an inmate. And he, he, his sort of famous quote is that, you know, when, um, we've lost all our, you know, the one thing that we can control is, is my response. I can't remember the exact quote, but you know, yeah. yeah, And there's there's a space in between trigger and response. And in that space lies your growth and your freedom. And when everything's been stripped away, you you actually do have a choice about how you personally are going to respond to something. Yeah. I know exactly the quote you're thinking of. And I just, it's on the tip of my tongue. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Um, I can see it in my mind's eye, sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, it's fine. It's, it's in between trigger and response, there's a space. And in that, in that space is your growth it, and your freedom. Absolutely. And it's about, and essentially it's about, that, so that relates to another theory, which is about post-traumatic growth. Um, right. So essentially um, it's about, so, so, so connecting to, to what I was talking about earlier, mm-hmm. not, not ignoring the negatives, yeah. Not dismissing the negatives, acknowledging the negatives, acknowledging the impact that they have on you, acknowledging the emotion that you're feeling, acknowledging what that does to your behavior and trying to make that into purposeful behavior, but also acknowledging the positives that there are in your life. There may not be many. There may be, you know, the ratio might be one to 10 positive to negative, but being mindful of those positives and concentrating on that positive because if you allow yourself to concentrate on the positive as well as acknowledging the negative you will notice that the positivity does breed positivity the positivity does allow you to soften the blows of the negativity mm. if, if that makes sense yeah and um, so, so again it's not about dismissing the emotions that you're feeling it's not about dismissing the significant hardship that we are all going through, but it's about trying to encompass in a very small way, if at all, the positives that there are, that that there are in our lives, Mm. Uh, because there will be a few. And if we are mindful of those, hopefully that seedling can be planted and that can grow into a great tree. As they say, the acorn has all the DNA all the information that it needs to grow into a big oak tree. So even one positive um, act, one positive thought has the um, all that it needs to grow into lots and lots of positivity in our mind. So if, if we use that analogy, we can, we can see how it can develop. Yeah, yeah. So, Amy, if you had three tips for people to take away that they could, they could try and do tomorrow, what, what would they be? So my tip would be to try to think of the things that you can control and not worry too much about the things that you can't control. Try to ensure that if you are feeling out of your depths with any professional circumstance, you are sharing that with your colleagues, with your mentor, with your peers, with your seniors, And if you feel that you can't share it with anybody at work, please contact support services that are out there. There are national support services out there. And please talk to people who you feel you can trust. And the third thing would be to ensure that you're having some social contact with people, whether that be on Zoom, Skype, WhatsApp, just calling people, writing a letter, um, however that is, whatever you choose, whatever fits for you, whatever you think is the right thing for you just Mm. please allow yourself to have some social contact with people yeah 
Great. And I think having listened to you, I think my, my tips that I'm taking away for this is um, firstly, plan your positivity. It's, you could just going, I must be more positive. Ah, it doesn't really help. But actually, if you work it, just think about what's going to work for you. I love those ideas of taking meaningful photos. And I, I did that a few years ago. I just started to keep a gratitude journal, but, but through photos instead. So I'm going to plan to do that. Um, and I think you need to be um, strategic if you're a team leader about how you can help relatedness within within your own team and I think even just having like a five minute team check-in once or twice a day either by zoom or just in the department where you are could be really important and that's for well-being not not just about processes but think about like how you are so um we'll in the show notes I'll put a link to some resources the team well-being covid toolkit that you can download and there's a, a, there's a whole sheet about how you do a five minute team checking because there's four key questions to ask there and I think my third one is just don't neglect the basic stuff you know right now get some sleep get some get, get some exercise eat well you know all those basic things that, that aren't rocket science that sometimes we just ignore um, and don't forget that you're you're not you're not superhuman um, as a doctor, as a frontline worker. And we're, we're in it for the long haul, really. It's not, it's not really a sprint. It is a marathon. And I keep trying to remind people of, of that. So it's just really being strategic about those, about those three things. So, Amy, if people wanted to get in touch with you, how would they do that? Sure. So um, you can get in touch with me on Twitter um, at, at your wellbeing doctor. That's D-R, not the word doctor. Mm -hmm. Um, and I have a website, which is www.yourwellbeing.doctor. That is D-O-C-T-O-R. Okay, great. And we'll put those in the show links as well. So, I mean, thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. I'd love to get you back on the podcast another time because I can't get enough of the positive psychology stuff. I'm just finding really fascinating. So um, thank you so much. Thank and you, um, well, yeah. Thank you so much for having have, me. You're welcome and have a great Easter weekend. You too. Have a lovely evening. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed this episode, then please share it with your friends and colleagues. Please subscribe to my You Are Not A Frog email list and subscribe to the podcast. And if you have enjoyed it, then please leave me a rating wherever you listen to your podcasts. So keep well, everyone. You're doing a great job. You got this.